the nature of the seed internally determines the nature of the harvest. And that's good news for every one of us because if you're a born again child of God, washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got the potential of the eternal kingdom of God inside of you. You may look small and insignificant to some people. It may appear as if your start is nothing to write home about, but I'm here to declare to you today that if you're a child of God, you've got the kingdom of God in you. You've got the power of God in you. You've got the anointing of God in you. You've got the promise of God in you. You've got the life of God in you. And the harvest that is coming from your life cannot be compared to where you started. Somebody say, I'm blessed. And that's Sam. Yes, this is all. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a village in northern Ghana where the farmers grew yams. But these were no ordinary yams. In fact, in this village, they grew the biggest and the best yams in all of Ghana. They were known throughout the land for producing the greatest yams. And the secret was that every harvest, these farmers set aside the biggest and the best yams for planting, and they only ate the small, ugly yams. Well, their system worked so well that every harvest, the yams got bigger and better and bigger and better. It was amazing, all until Kweku Anansi came along. You see, Kweku Anansi happened to live in this village, and he did not like this system of saving the biggest, best yams for planting and eating the small, ugly yams. Why? Kweku Anansi thought it would be good to eat the big yams now. After all, life is meant to enjoy. So he started a campaign to change the system of sowing and reaping in this village and to convince the farmers that every harvest they should all eat the biggest and the best yams and leave the small ugly ones for planting next year. Well, as we all know, Anansi can be very persuasive. And as he went from house to house, from farm to farm, he was able to convince all the farmers in this village to change their system. At harvest, they would eat the big and best yams and save the small ugly ones for planting next year. And so it was at that next harvest, everybody was so blessed. They ate the biggest and best yams and saved the small ugly ones for planting. And everybody was feasting. They were eating and eating and eating and enjoying as badly quicker Anansi. But at the next harvest after that, the farmers were in for a surprise. For it seemed like the yams were not quite as good as before. It seemed that they were smaller and a little bit more ugly. Nevertheless, at the next time, they decided to follow the same system. They set aside the small, ugly yams for planting, and they ate the biggest and best yams. But at the second harvest, oh my, what a shock. Everything had gone wrong. There were no good yams at all. And instead of feasting and rejoicing, there was crying and hunger in the village. All too late, the farmers discovered the law of blessing that as you sow, so you will reap. And if you want to be blessed, you have to sow accordingly. That's the powerful lesson we're going to learn in our sermon. But first of all, I want to ask you a question. What would you do for money? What would you be willing to do if someone came and offered you a sum of money to do something crazy or really weird? For example, if someone came and said, I will give you a thousand Ghana CDs if you will eat a cockroach. Would you do it? Eat a cockroach for a thousand? Okay, how about this? If someone said, I will offer you a hundred thousand Ghana CDs. A hundred thousand. Hey! A hundred thousand Ghana CDs if you will appear on GTV on the evening news completely naked. Some of you are thinking about that. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. What about this? What if someone came and said, I will give you one million Ghana CDs if you agree to be locked up in Insuam prison for two years? A million CDs, Insuam for two years. I don't know, but you might want to volunteer your husband, okay? The fact is, people have done some really crazy and weird things for money. 
In fact, I hear there are rumors that some of the Ghana celebrities go to Dubai and the things they do for money is bizarre. But the good news for all of us, you don't need to do anything weird. The good news for all of us is that God has a simple, proven plan of how you can be blessed. He has a promise for how every need in your life can be blessed. And it's summarized in three simple words, sow and reap. You see, God's laws work for everybody, and God has the law of sowing and reaping. You don't have to embarrass yourself or eat something crazy. You simply have to obey God's proven laws of sowing and reaping. And when you do, God promises that he will meet every need in your life. That's the promise we found in our scripture text. Listen to what God's saying. If you sow, you'll reap. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. And listen to verse 8 again. He is able to bless you abundantly. God says, I've got all the power and all the resources to bless you. And then he says, I can bless you in all things at all times, having all that you need so that you will abound in every good work. Wow. Somebody say wow. But remember, God's promise of blessing dictates that you have to sow in order to reap. You have to sow to be blessed. So here's the first truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. The determining factor in blessings is not God's ability to bless you. It's your willingness to sow. That's why we need to encourage you today on three truths that will help you, motivate you to sow to be blessed. And here's your first truth today. Your seed determines your harvest. Take your pen and fill in the blank with the word seed and just say that after me. Your seed determines your harvest. Now, I realize that may not sound like a profound truth to you. After all, we've all been to school, we've all studied science, and we all know that the seed determines the harvest. If you plant a maize seed, you're going to reap a maize plant. If you sow a pepper seed, you'll grow a pepper plant. An orange seed can't produce a mango tree. A tomato seed cannot produce a yam. And the Bible tells us this very truth in 1 Corinthians 15, 38. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Every seed produces a plant according to the DNA inside the seed. What's inside the seed will eventually come out and be produced in the plant. But here's the funny thing about that truth. You cannot determine the harvest based on the external view of the seed. The harvest is much greater than the seed. And when you look at the seed, you can't determine what the outcome will be. The external appearance of the seed does not reflect the internal potential of the seed. For example, a small black seed produces a big green watermelon. The seed gives you no indication of the plant that will come when it's sown. In fact, some of the smallest seeds produce the biggest trees. So the outcome of the seed has nothing to do with how it starts. The outcome of the seed has nothing to do with where it's headed. The outcome of the seed has nothing to do with the size of the seed. You cannot determine the size of the harvest by the size of the seed. Every seed has within it the potential that God has placed there. A flower seed produces flower. A seed that has greatness inside of it will produce something great. The nature of the seed internally determines the nature of the harvest. And that's good news for every one of us because if you're a born again child of God, washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got the potential of the eternal kingdom of God inside of you. You may look small and insignificant to some people. It may appear as if your start is nothing to write home about. But I'm here to declare to you today that if you're a child of God, you You've got the kingdom of God in you. You've got the power of God in you. You've got the anointing of God in you. You've got the promise of God in you. You've got the life of God in you. And the harvest that is coming from your life cannot be compared to where you started. Somebody say, I'm blessed. That's why 1 Peter 1.23 says, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. And when you're born again by God's holy seed, you've got an imperishable seed inside of you. You've got the potential of God's kingdom inside of you. It doesn't matter where you start. It's where you're going that counts. And men may have counted you out. And people may have turned aside and said, there's no way he will make it. But 
the seed is not determined by what you see. It's determined by what's inside, and God is inside of you. And if the smallest seed can produce the biggest tree, then the power of God inside of you can produce something eternally life-changing. Somebody say amen. That's why Zechariah 4.10 says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. But here's the problem. Even though you've got potential, even though there's an imperishable seed inside of you, the problem for most of us is this. When our seed looks small, we don't sow it at all. And you need to understand this morning that no matter how small your seed is, you've got to sow it to get to your harvest. You've got to sow it to get to your potential. Without a seed, there is no harvest. No seed, no harvest. You've got to sow in order to reap. But with a seed sown, a mighty harvest is possible. That's why I declare to you today, all you need is a seed. Tell your neighbor, all you need is a seed. And see, this is where a lot of us are getting tripped up because we think we need something different. A lot of us came here today thinking, I need this blessing and I need that blessing. And we're looking for a harvest instead of looking at the seed we have. But all you need is a seed. You think you need a blessing, but what you really need is to sow your seed. You think you need a harvest, but what you really need is a seed. For the harvest will come when the seed is planted. This is a law of God. I didn't write it. God wrote it. Way back in Genesis 8.22, God said, As long as the earth endures until Jesus comes again, seed time and harvest will never cease. God has established the law of sowing and reaping, of seed time and harvest. God doesn't give us a harvest without a seed. But the good news is God has given every one of us a seed. You may not realize it, but you've got more than you think. You may think you have nothing today, but God says, I've given you a seed, and if you've sown it and you sow it in my kingdom, you'll reap a harvest, for we all have a seed. That's the lesson we can learn from the inspiring true story of a man named Reggie Nelson, a man of Ghanaian ancestry living in London, UK. Reggie Nelson didn't have the kind of background that seemed advantageous for success in life. He was born and grew up in a government-subsidized public housing project for the poor. He attended ordinary public schools, and he didn't even have a very good academic record. His father was an alcoholic. And then when Reggie Nelson was 17 years old, his father died. And suddenly, Reggie faced a very uncertain future, living in a poor housing estate with a poor education, without a good academic record, without direction, without a father. It didn't appear he had anything to boost him in life. But Reggie Nelson discovered the truth that we all need to learn today. All you need is a seed. And Reggie determined to sow the seed he had so that he could reap a better harvest. So Reggie sat down one day at 17 years of age and did a Google search for the richest area in London. The search came back, Kensington. So Reggie dressed up, took public transport to Kensington, and then used the seat he had and started knocking on doors of houses in Kensington. He proceeded to go from house to house, knocking on doors with nothing but a smile and a speech. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. My name's Reggie Nelson. I'm 17 years of age. I see that you're living in a wealthy area, and I want to know if you could advise me what path I can follow to achieve success like you. Reggie didn't ask for money. He did not ask for a job. He did not ask for a favor. He asked for advice. How can I be successful? Well, you can imagine a man of Ghanaian ancestry knocking on doors unexpectedly in the richest area of London. Most people didn't answer the door. Some slammed the door in his face. Some people said no. But Reggie kept knocking. He kept sowing the seed he had. He had his smile. He had his speech. He had his personality, his time, and his faith. And finally, he came to a white stucco house. And when he knocked on that door, his seed began to reap a harvest. When Reggie knocked on the door of the white stucco house, a lady answered through the security intercom. Yes, may I help you? Hello, he said. I'm Reggie Nelson. I'm 17 years of age. I've come to ask for your advice on how I could be successful in life. 
There was a pause, and the lady said, just a moment. She came and opened the door and invited Reggie inside. Reggie Nelson had just been invited inside the home of Quinton Price, a top fund manager at BlackRock, the world's largest investment company. When Quinton Price came in, he took a liking to Reggie, and something changed in his life forever. Quinton Price agreed to mentor Reggie. He didn't offer him money, didn't give him a job, but he said, I'm going to help guide you in life. Under his tutelage, Reggie enrolled at Kingston University and earned an economics degree. From there, he became an account manager and eventually an analyst for a large investment firm. Reggie's life has changed dramatically. Today, he is a successful investment banker in London, England, because he sowed the seed he had. And he's reaping a harvest. When Reggie Nelson started out, it seemed he had nothing. 17 years of age with no father, no good education. His seed looked too small. His background seemed too insignificant to make a difference. He could have looked at the obstacles and said, I'm buried under so much dirt. I will never germinate and rise. But he had the seed of faith. He had the seed of his time. He had the seed of his life and the seed of his talent. And he said, all I need is a seed. And when he sowed the seed in faith, God answered and gave him a harvest. And I say to you today, we all have a seed. We all have the seed of faith. For Romans 12, 3 says, God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. And you can sow your seed of faith today and begin serving God and reaping the rewards that faith brings. We all have a seed of time. And you can begin to sow your seed of time and start serving at Agape House. We all have the seed of truth. And you can sow your seed of truth and invite people to prophetic gathering. We all have a seed of love, and you can start showing love and kindness to people. We all have a seed of our word, and you can use your word to encourage somebody. In fact, when you leave here today, start encouraging the ushers. Start encouraging the car park attendants. Encourage Heart Song. If you can't think of anybody to encourage, write on my Facebook page, thank you, Reverend Whitcomb, for being the best pasta I ever had. We all have a seed. We can all sow something today. Our time, our words, our money. The fact is we can all begin to sow to reap a harvest. So here's the truth you need to put on your keychain and carry along with you. Everything in your hand is a seed. And everything in God's hand is a harvest. But here's the challenge we face. We know we have a seed. We know there's potential in us. We know that inside of us is the imperishable word of God. But there are two kinds of seed, good seed and bad seed. And when you sow the good seed, you get a good harvest. But if you sow the bad seed, you get a bad harvest. The type of seed determines the type of harvest. And we need to take stock today of our lives and action. What kind of seed am I sowing? For Galatians 6, 7 says, you will always with harvest what you plant. If you sow seeds of hope, you'll reap hope. If you sow seeds of love, you'll reap love. If you sow financial offerings into God's work, you will reap financial blessings. But you've got to take heed to your seed. Tell your neighbor, take heed to your seed. I'll be frank, some of you are so busy sowing bad seeds, you're not sowing any good seeds at all. You spend hours on social media sowing seeds of jealousy and resentment. You have no time to sow seeds of love and mercy. You sit in the office complaining and criticizing, sowing negative words, sowing negative seeds, and you're not spending any time sowing seeds of love and mercy. You're sowing seeds of pleasure instead of seeds of righteousness. But your seed determines your harvest. When you sow bad words, you reap a bad harvest. If you sow bad attitudes, you reap a bad harvest. When you sow your money into alcohol and drugs and pornography and immoral pleasures, you reap a bad harvest. Listen to me, young men. Some of you go out and party all night. You never open your textbooks, and you're expecting to graduate upper-class honors. Brah, it doesn't work that way. Young ladies, please listen to me. Some of you sleep with any man who buys you dinner, and then you expect to marry Prince Charming. Girl, it doesn't work that way. You can't fly Satan's airline and expect Jesus to pick you up at the airport. 
Turn your notes over to page two. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. You have to take heed to your seed. The seed you plant determines the crop you reap. That's why Galatians 6, 8 says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So what seeds are you sowing? Are you sowing seeds that will reap good benefits? Are you sowing seeds that will reap death and destruction? Are you sowing peace and love or discord and disunity? Are you sowing seeds of greed or sowing seeds of generosity? Are you sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit? And that brings us to our second truth. Your sowing determines your reaping. Take your pen, fill in the blank with the word sowing, and everybody say it after me. Your sowing determines your reaping. That's exactly what our scripture text said in verse 6. Listen again. Remember this. God wants to emphasize. Remember it. Nudge your neighbor. Say, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. In other words, it's not just the power of the seed. It's not just the seed that matters. But the manner of your sowing also determines the manner of your reaping. Your seed determines your harvest. Your sowing determines you're reaping. A lot of people have a lot of seed that they're holding on to. And if you don't sow your seed, no matter how great that seed is, it will abide alone. A lot of people have seed that they're holding on to, but your seed won't produce anything until it's planted. You have to give it away. You have to cast your bread upon the waters. You have to release what's in your hand and sow. That's the lesson we can learn from the old farmer and his two sons. This old farmer had vast acres and tracts of land, greater than he'd ever been able to use. He didn't have a lot of cash, seemed to have nothing in this life except all this land. He'd farmed it using simple tools and simple methods, but it seemed like he'd never really gotten ahead. Well, one day, unfortunately, he fell sick, and he lay dying on his deathbed. He called his only two children, his two sons, the older and the younger, to come because he had an important message for them. And as they gathered near in a weak, trembling voice, he called them close and said, My sons, I have nothing much to give you except for the great amount of land I have. I don't have a lot of cash or worldly goods, but I have the land, and I have a secret. I haven't told you this before, but buried in my land is a treasure. There's treasure buried in our land. It's just under the surface. You just have to dig and find it. There's treasure. There's treasure. With that, the old man died with the words, there's treasure in the land, ringing in the room. Well, the two sons were shocked. They never knew that their father had a treasure. He'd never told them he'd buried a treasure. And they made a covenant together that as soon as they completed all the funeral rites, they would go and begin to search for that treasure. And so it was after a few months and the man had been buried and everything had been accomplished, the two brothers took shovels and they started at one end of the land and they worked systematically. They started digging and digging and digging. They got up early in the morning and stayed up late at night. They worked tirelessly six days a week digging and digging and digging. They spent weeks and then months digging and digging, moving systematically through the field, looking for that treasure. And finally, they came to the end of the field. Finally, they came to the end of the land and they turned the last shovel of dirt over and there they found nothing. Hey, I thought there was treasure in the field, the younger brother said. The senior brother said, well, maybe we didn't dig deep enough. Let's go back and try again. No way, the junior brother said. I've had it. I'm disgusted. This is worthless. You can keep this useless land. I'm going to Accra to make my fortune. And with that, the junior brother packed up and left. The senior brother sat alone and dejected on the land. He had nothing to show for his months of hard work except for the fact that the land had been prepared for planting. So he said, I might as well plant a crop. He went to the market and bought some seed and sowed the entire land. The far and wide stretches of the land were sown with seed. Then, because they dug up the ground so well and prepared the land so thoroughly as they were searching for treasure, the crop became very powerful. It grew and grew to a mighty harvest. And at harvest time, the older brother gathered in all the harvest and took it to the market and sold it. And on his way back from the market, he was counting all the money he'd made when suddenly the words of his father rang in his ears. There's treasure in the land. 
there's treasure in the land. And suddenly the senior brother realized the treasure wasn't stones of gold. The treasure wasn't a box of jewels. The treasure was the potential of the harvest. And as he'd sown, so now he was reaping. For the way you sow determines the way you reap. And if you sow generously, you will reap generously. This is true in every area of your life. It's true in love. It's true in hope. It's true in your relationships. It's true with your career and your talent. But it's especially true in the area of giving. For note that our scripture text today specifically talks about giving. Listen to verse 7. It says, each of you should give. Somebody say give. What you've decided in your heart to give, say give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, everybody say it together, giver. The law of sowing and reaping works in every area of life, but God specifically in this passage relates it to finances. He says, if you'll give generously, I will reward you generously. And I'm here to declare to you today, if you will step out in faith and sow a mighty seed of finance into the kingdom of God, he promises to bless you. He will reward you. He is able to abundantly provide for you in every area of your life. He's able to overwhelm you with prosperity. And if you give to God, he will give back to you good measure, press down, shaken together and running over. If you cast your bread on the water, it will come back multiplied to you. And I speak by faith that if you will step out today and begin to sow generously with the seed God has given you, he's going to reward you. He's going to come alongside you. He's going to replenish you and fill you and make your harvest abundant. But the key is you have to step out first and give. You have to step out first and sow for no sowing, no reaping, no giving, no blessing. But when you do give, God promises he will be abundant and provide for you. If you believe it, say amen. And sometimes in my life I've wondered, is this really true? Does God really promise financial blessings when we give? But over and over in the Bible, you can't deny the word of God. The law of sowing and reaping works with finance. Listen to Proverbs 22.9. A generous man will himself be blessed. Listen to Proverbs 11.25. A generous man will prosper. That's a promise. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And I stand as a testimony before you today that I can testify for my wife and I for the last 40 years we've been faithful to give to God we are careful to pay our tithe down to the last Pessoa we are generous in our giving and in our offering and yes there have been times when our faith is tested and yes there have been times when things look difficult but we've never lacked food and we've never lacked shelter and we've never lacked clothing and today we are better off financially than we have ever been in our life we are blessed and we are prospering because God's word works and God's promises are true. He cannot lie. And when you sow, you will reap. When you sow generously, you will reap generously. Somebody say amen. And I know a lot of you here today can testify like me that God has kept his word and you've been blessed. But let us never forget the blessings have come as we've obeyed his word. We must remember to sow in order to reap. But I believe this truth also brings a challenge to us today. You see, the fact is we've tested God. We've proven God. Many of you can share that testimony with me. Say, God's answered my needs and met me every way. And yet, for some reason, we've reached a plateau in our giving. We've been sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping, but we're satisfied with the status quo. In fact, sadly, some of us are less generous today than we were previously. Some of us are less generous now than we were when we were poor, broke university students. You see, when you're a broke university student and they say, give all you have, it's two CDs. What is two CDs? But today, if the pastor says, give all you have, it's two million CDs. And that's more difficult to give. Some of us, when our tithe was 10 Ghana CDs, it's 10 Ghana CDs. If you lost it, it didn't mean Today, your tithe is 10,000, and you think, you know, I think I'll just split it in two. Hold on to some and give the others later. But I hear God challenging us today to move into a new realm of generosity. So let me ask you, are you more generous today than you were last year? 
Because I hear God saying, if I've proven myself true and you've been blessed through giving, why don't you escalate your giving? Why don't you accelerate your giving? Why don't you become even more generous and sow even greater so that you can reap even greater? I challenge you to take the next step of faith. For the moment you stop sowing is the moment the harvest begins to fade. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shake it together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. And understand what God is telling us today. He said, there is no cap on what blessing you can receive. There's no limit. There's no ceiling. He says specifically, the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. In other words, your sowing determines your reaping. And God has blessed you thus far. He promises to bless the generous. Why stay in the same realm? God challenges us today to go beyond into a new realm of generosity and a new realm of faith and challenge ourselves to double our giving, double our sowing, that we might double and increase our reaping. That takes faith, and that brings us to our third truth. Your faith determines your fruit. Take your pen and fill in the blank with the word faith and say it after me. Your faith determines your fruit. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith, let it be done to you. In other words, with faith, your harvest can exceed expectation. See, it takes faith to sow. When you release that seed, when you release that offering, when you pay your tithe, it takes faith. But when you use faith and sow, your fruit will exceed your expectation. That's why 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and 11 says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower God gives seed to the sower, not to the hoarder. And bread for food. Supply and multiply the seed you've sown. God says, I'm not only going to bless and multiply your harvest, I'm going to multiply your seed so you can sow more. May he multiply the seed you've sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. God says, I give to those who give. Today, he's challenging you to step out in faith and begin to give more that he might bless your harvest, bless your seed, and start on a never-ending cycle of increased sowing and increased reaping by faith. What's in your hand? What can you sow? Release it by faith, and God will bring abundance. That's the lesson we could learn from the man who was stranded in the Sahara Desert. Some years ago, a man set out on a journey in his Pajero to cross the Sahara Desert. It was a challenge, an adventure he wanted to take. He thought he had everything he would need to succeed in the journey. He stockpiled food and water. But what he wasn't prepared for was in the middle of the desert with miles and miles of sand around and no one anywhere near his vehicle unexpectedly broke down. There was no cell service. There was no mobile phone. No one for any distance around. No one to call. No one who saw him. And he realized he was deeply in trouble. He had food and water, but if he stayed in the vehicle, he might consume the food and water before anyone discovered his body rotting in the desert. So he decided to pack up the water he had and begin to trek across the desert, hoping he could reach a village or a town or an oasis. So he set off with the water in tow carrying as much as he could, but the sun was so hot it was brutal and the wind was so fierce and the sand was difficult to walk. And as the days went by, he started consuming his water until finally he drank the last and threw the bottle away. There was nothing left and he faced a certain death. He was getting weaker and weaker as he was dehydrated. He crawled across the sand not knowing what would happen. Suddenly he came to the end of his strength. He didn't think he could make it any further. When he looked up and saw in the distance an oasis, there were palm trees and flowers, and he thought he saw the image of a well. So the man mustered his last strength, his last energy, and began to race as quickly as he could to the oasis. When he got there, certainly there it was. There was a well. He started rejoicing. He had had a hand pump, and he thought, oh, now I'm going to be saved. I'll have enough to drink. He reached over to the hand pump and began pumping. <laughs> No, 
nothing happened. And all of a sudden, the man realized the pump had been sitting there for years and it was dry. Unless he took water and primed the pump, it wouldn't work. But there was no water outside the well, nothing left, and he collapsed in the sand, hopeless in despair. He threw himself down, and his hand hit something hard under the sand. He brushed aside the sand and discovered there was a bottle, a bottle of water. Oh, hallelujah, he said, I'm saved, I'm saved. And he grabbed the bottle, uncapped it, and put it to his lips. But it was then he noticed a handwritten sign taped to the bottle. Do not drink this water. Hey, I'm dying of thirst. What do you mean don't drink this water? And underneath it was written in small letters, use this water to prime the pump and you'll have all the water you need. And he had a choice. He could drink the water and be temporarily satisfied, but die in a few days. Or he could reach out in faith and pour out what he had to prime the pump and hope and pray for an abundance. He put the bottle to his lips. He put it to the pump. Put it to his lips. Put it to the pump. Put it to his lips. Put it to the pump. And finally, with every ounce of faith he had, he closed his eyes and poured out every drop of water to prime the pump. He threw the empty bottle away and grabbed the pump. <coughs> Nothing happened. Wait, did you hear it? Water. A flood of water, an abundance of water came gushing out of the well. He bathed in it. He drank it. Everything he needed was supplied when he released what was in his hand and stepped out in faith. Listen to me today. The fact is, that's how faith operates. You've got to believe his word. You've got to release what's in your hand. You've got to sow your seed for no faith, no fruit. Do you believe God's word today? Do you believe that God does what he says? Then listen to 2 Corinthians 9, 8 one more time. He's able to bless you abundantly. He's able to provide for you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. But remember, your seed determines your harvest. Remember that your sowing determines your reaping. And remember that your faith determines your fruit. Today, God is calling on all of us to apply the law of sowing and reaping to our lives and to our giving. He's telling us you've got to sow to be blessed. Would you stand together with me all across the auditorium in the balcony? And I want to take a moment and pray for you today. Our Father in heaven, I lift up your children to you. And I ask that you give us the insight, the wisdom, and the conviction of your word today. Speak to us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Apply these truths to our individual lives today. Give us the courage to step out and sow the seed in our hand. Give us the courage to sow far and wide. Give us the courage to step out in faith and accelerate our giving that we might accelerate our blessing for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.